In the 1920s and 30s, Londoners travelled around their capital much more than they'd ever done before. The distance between home and work grew longer and longer as new suburbs were built, doubling the size of London in just 25 years. New and much more efficient forms of public transport made travel quicker and easier. Until the late 1930s, very few Londoners owned a motor car. The irate motorist, cautioned for parking in the wrong place or fuming with anger in a traffic jam, was not unknown, but still a rarity. This was the heyday of public transport, when the number of passengers carried by buses, trams and tubes was reaching its historic peak. But until 1933, London had no transport authority. It was a competitive business, with private commercial operators fighting for the custom of commuters. The largest bus operator, the General, was challenged in the 20s by rival independent or pirate bus companies, as Ted Harrison remembers. Yes, if you wanted to go anywhere quick, you'd go on a pirate. You'd prefer the pirates. They had pro bono publico, new enterprise, chocolate express, I fly, oh, I had a bloody load of names, you know, all fancy, and all gaily painted. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, and they used to fly along there. Scurf you on, ring the bell before you had a chance, we would push you in there, so that's it. Or upstairs, because they were open tops. And then you race to the next stop, and the old general, you know, he loved. He used to race the generals. It was from this kind of cutthroat competition that London's transport system was forged. The single most powerful and influential of these commercial transport operators was the Underground Group. This great combine stamped a character and style on the whole system, some of which London Transport retains today. Much of this was created in the 20s and 30s, but the story of London's modern transport network goes back to a remarkable period before 1914, when the means of travel in the capital were rapidly revolutionised. Nearly the whole of London's electric underground system was built before the First World War. The first section of the deep level tube to be burrowed out ran from Stockwell in South London to the city. Like all transport ventures in London at the time, the City and South London line was financed by a private company anxious to make a profit. In 1900, another company built the first section of the central line, running from the bank to Shepherd's Bush. At the same time, the electric tram rapidly replaced the horse tram of the 19th century. This was thought to be the transport of the future, and the London County Council, which owned much of the tram network, built a tunnel under Kingsway to link the northern and southern services. But in 1910, a great competitor for both the tube and the tram arrived in the form of the first successful motor bus. The old horse bus was rapidly replaced and a remarkable technological revolution in London's transport was complete. However, in this rapidly changing and highly competitive era in London transport, there was a serious problem. Few of the competing companies made much money. After the opening of the central line, many new tube lines had been approved by Parliament but the capital cost of building them and the poor profit record of transport deterred investors. It was at this point, around 1900, that an American, Charles Tyson Yerkes, arrived in London. Yerkes was a rather shady character who thought he could make a fortune out of London transport. His first venture was to raise the money to build a proposed line from Charing Cross to Hampstead Heath as Professor Theo Barker of the London School of Economics explains. Well, Yerkes had made a fortune in rapid transit in Chicago. He'd been driven out of Chicago because he'd been unable to bribe the city fathers any longer. That was 1899. And he knew that there were tube lines authorised in London by Act of Parliament, but the capital couldn't be raised. And he, he came here, came up here to Hampstead, came to Hampstead Heath, looked out, 
it was a, a misty sort of day, and then all of a sudden, the sun came out and he saw London below. His imagination fired, Yerke set about raising money to build the line in which wary British investors had no interest. He had a great reputation for making profits out of public transport in America, but the English realized that there was no money to be made at all. And the result was that he was able to raise the capital, mainly in America, also to some extent in Europe, a little bit from this country, but mainly America. This particular tube was built between 1902 and 1905, and then opened in 1907. Yerkes raised the money not only for the Hampstead line, but for the Piccadilly, which ran from Finsbury Park to Hammersmith, and for the tube from Baker Street to Waterloo, known as the Bakerloo. The characteristic red-tiled tube stations of the period, with many Edwardian features still intact, can be seen all over London. Contemporary observers thought the Yerkes tubes had an American flavour. Whereas the English had always talked about up and down trains, now it was northbound, southbound, OK, OK. Yerkes died in 1905, before the tubes he financed were completed, and before it was realised how little money they could make in the fiercely competitive London transport system. His company, the Underground Electric Railways, nearly went bankrupt. But another American, Albert Stanley, was sent over to rescue it. He succeeded by buying up the company's rivals, notably the most profitable operator, the General Bus Company. And Stanley saw that the newly motorised buses of the General were a great winner and was able to buy out the General. And that formed the combine uh, which together with the central line and the original Stockwell line, which they bought before the First World War, set the scene for the interwar years. The Great War brought an abrupt halt to the development of public transport in London. Many of the new motor buses were commandeered by the army and saw action on the Western Front. Women were taken on by the bus and tube companies to keep London transport running. But soon the concentration of activity in London, with constant troop movements and the growth of the military machine on the home front, began to increase passenger traffic. The switch to a war economy disrupted established patterns of commuting as more and more jobs became concentrated in the armaments industry. Munitions workers were discouraged from moving home to be nearer their jobs by a rent freeze imposed by the government. Home and work were pulled further and further apart, greatly increasing the amount of travel in London and putting a great strain on the existing services. And when the war was over and London switched back to a peacetime economy, the dispersal of the population to new suburbs and housing estates continued to increase the distance commuters had to travel to work. But there was no single planning authority which could control both the siting of new housing estates and the location of new industry. While the LCC was building Beckentree in the east of London, destined to become the largest council housing estate in Europe, much new industry was growing up in the West. A quarter of a million people work in London's engineering industry alone. Representative of these, Jack Kentish operates a four-table radial drilling machine in a large electrical engineering factory at Acton. For 22 years he has worked in this factory, travelling by tube and bus from Camden Town in North London every day. The rise of a new industrial belt around London, often a long way from the homes of working class people in Victorian housing, increased the average journey to work. Les White lived in Bow in East London, but found that the best paid job he could get was on the other side of the capital, at the new Hoover factory. To save money, he cycled all the way. A Hoover started work 
at seven o'clock in the morning. This meant I had to leave Bow about a quarter to half past five to get there in time. The journey took anything between an hour and a half to an hour and three quarters, sometimes less, depending whether I got a lift on the lorry. Occasionally, a nice slow lorry would come along, which we would grab hold of and get a free lift. And then we'd pedal on to Shepherd Bush, Wood Lane up the Western Avenue. If we got to Hoover's after seven o'clock, then the gates were shut. And we had to turn around and pedal home again. Fortunately, this never happened to me. I managed it every morning and got there in time. There was a great increase in the number of commuter cyclists in the interwar years, but the majority had to rely on public transport. The ability to travel long distances was increased by the general introduction of a shorter eight-hour working day and the rise in real incomes of those who had jobs. Much of the extra time and money was spent getting to and from work. But there was also more time and money for entertainment. The attendance at sporting events such as football matches rose steadily. Most major clubs such as Arsenal had their grounds in Victorian London, while many supporters lived in new suburbs or on council estates a long way off. As the distance between home and work or pleasure increased, more and more people ate out at lunchtime. Cafes and canteens were themselves staffed by cooks and waitresses who commuted to work. By 1930, Londoners were, on average, taking twice as many journeys a year as in 1914. Nearly all this increase in travel was handled by private commercial undertakings, but it was difficult for any of them to make much money. There were too many separate transport operators and no coordination in the system. In inner London, most of the trams were run by the London County Council. In the northwest, there was Metroland, the territory carved out by the Metropolitan Railway. The Southern Railway ruled the rails south of the river, greatly improving its services with the electrification of trains from the 1920s onwards. And there was the single most powerful operator of public transport services, the Underground Group, which had been founded by the American Yerkes. The underground group owned most of the tube lines, the general bus company, and some tram lines. It was the policies and dynamism of this one commercial company which were crucial to the development of London transport between the wars. Albert Stanley, who became Lord Ashfield, was the financial brains behind the group. But it was a remarkable Englishman who created the style and character of London transport, as Oliver Green of the London Transport Museum explains. The person responsible for the design style of London Transport, which developed in the 20s and 30s, was Frank Pick, who had joined the company before the First World War and become its traffic officer, which meant he had responsibility for publicity. And in that period, he developed London Transport's famous policy of commissioning good artists, the best commercial art. He then went on to commission Edward Johnston, a famous typographer, to produce a special typeface for the underground, which was used on all its advertising. In the 1920s, he began to commission outside architects, and specifically Charles Holden, to design a new range of underground stations, which were in a completely new architectural idiom. To cope with the vastly increased traffic in the centre, the old Piccadilly Circus station was completely redesigned and reopened in 1928. With its Art Deco lighting, it became the underground group's great showpiece. Escalators replaced the old lifts to speed up the movement of passengers, and a maze of tunnels was burrowed out beneath Piccadilly Circus. The whole design attracted worldwide admiration. Frank Pick's concern with creating a distinctive style was also displayed in the new stations built on extensions to existing lines, such as the Piccadilly. Not much of the old feel of these stations has survived. 
though at Southgate, some of the 30s decor has been preserved. Frank Pick had a sort of utopian vision. The look that he was creating for the underground was on the one hand to generate passengers and income, but it was also part of his company's contribution to uh, a civilized urban community. Frank Pitt was obviously a, a rather extraordinary character. He was very punctilious. He always used a fountain pen with green ink, and indeed he took lessons from a calligrapher so that even his own style was immaculate. He would descend on a station and check that everything was working, and then the next day he would send off a memo to say that the litter bins had been placed wrongly or something like that in the station. The stylishness of the underground group stations and the extent of the interwar modernization program might suggest that this powerful operator made huge profits, but it did not. The capital cost of renovating stations and building new lines was too great, and public transport with a poor profit record could not attract sufficient private investment. In the past, American investors had come to the rescue. In the 20s and 30s, it was the British government. Nearly the whole of the modernization and extension of the tube system was underwritten by treasury guarantees offered for building work which created jobs and helped relieve unemployment. But even with government funds, the underground group felt it could not make profits unless it extended the tube lines and encouraged Londoners to make more journeys, as Oliver Green explains. I think the expansionist policy in the 20s and 30s in many ways follows the experience of what had happened before the First World War. Ashfield and Pick, running the company, saw what had happened at Golders Green, which was the first place that the tube had reached open countryside, and a great suburb had developed very quickly as a result of the railway service being there. So in the 1920s, they begin extending tube lines further out into what was then countryside with the expectation that suburban development would then generate more traffic and they felt that this was essential because it was a good way of establishing a firm traffic base. Because once you'd got that captive market of commuters, they would stay with you. The underground group did much to improve its services, but it could only operate in its own territory. For many London commuters, reliant on mainline trains or trams, the journey to work remained miserable. The crush at Sidcup station in the early 30s is still a vivid memory for George Matthews. Oh, it was absolutely shocking, absolutely shocking. When you got to the station, there was four, four or five deep on the station, and they were all trying to catch the same train, probably. They used to be about 7.36 to get up in London by 8 o'clock to get the workman's ticket, otherwise you didn't get the cheap fares. And as the train came in, of course, it stopped at one or two stations coming down, starting from Dartford, and the time it got to... Sid Cup, it was absolutely packed. And as you opened the door, so about four or five bottoms had come out, you'd have to shove them in. Then everybody would swoosh and shove and get your elbows in to try and get in. Oh, and it was absolutely out. So I got the bike out and I got used to going on the bike and the next, right up until I retired, I went up my bike and back every day, whatever the weather. For Doris Hanslow, whose family had moved out to a new council estate at Bromley in Kent, the tram journey to work was miserable. Everybody used to rush to get a workman's tram because it was less money. But um, sometimes you'd, you'd have an acid tablet, what your mum used to give you to stop you being sick, but it didn't help. And, and sometimes you'd get there and uh, sometimes you'd have to get off, you know, and, and wait for the next one because you felt so sick. The idea that London's transport network could be properly run only with a single authority to coordinate services was gaining ground by the late 1920s. This was a view not only of the London County Council, but of the underground group itself. By 1928, when the group built itself a grand new headquarters at 55 Broadway, it was beginning to behave almost like a public authority. The building, designed by Charles Holden, the architect of Piccadilly Circus and many of the new tube stations, was marked with Frank Pick's concern with style and detail. It was, by the standards of the day, daring and controversial, with sculptures by young artists such as Henry Moore and Jacob Epstein adorning the exterior. While Frank Pick continued to set the style of the underground group, 
the chairman, Lord Ashfield, was more and more convinced that a purely commercial operator on its own could not improve London's transport services. This had always been the view of Herbert Morrison, London's leading Labour politician. When, in 1929, Morrison became Transport Minister, he set about creating a London Transport Authority and found an ally in Lord Ashfield. During the 1920s, Ashfield was continually arguing the case that the main problem for London's traffic, the public traffic, was that there was no proper coordination. And it became clear after a while that the only way forward was to establish some kind of semi-public body. And in this, you got a strange alliance between the, um, the capitalist uh, Lord Ashfield and the Cockney socialist Morrison. The London Passenger Transport Board was created in 1933. It took over most transport services, except the mainline railways. Its headquarters became that of the Underground Group. And the same two men, Lord Ashfield and Frank Pick, were in charge. London at last had something like a coordinated transport system. But just at this time, it began to face serious competition for the first time from the motor car. Only the relatively well-off could afford a car, even in the mid-30s. But the impact of private motorists was proportionately much greater than their numbers. Before the days of driving tests and traffic management, the motorists ran wild, as Lady Strickland, a great society beauty of the 30s, recalls. They had very fast cars, because in those days, you didn't have to pass a test. A friend took you on the road for a few times to learn the gate gears, and then off you went. And they did terrible things. One friend of mine used to go up a very curvy road near Godalming on the wrong side for a thrill, and he was killed quite quickly. Another one used to go over humpback bridges at 70, in the middle, in case he met something for a thrill. And my uncle, the same age as me, he tried to drive his MG over a passenger bridge in a railway station as had up. Um, they were quite crazy. We all were, I suppose. The number of people killed and injured on the roads rose dramatically in London until driving tests and a 30 miles an hour speed limit were introduced in 1935. Fears that the 30 mile an hour slowdown would cause congestion in traffic jams have fortunately been groundless. Even in the busiest parts of the city of London, the smooth, well-regulated flow of transport goes on its way without hitch or hindrance. But by the time motorists' wilder impulses were brought under control, their sheer numbers were beginning to cause serious traffic problems in the centre of London. Reports were commissioned to provide a solution to the problem. Sir Charles Bressy was the author of one which foresaw the impact the car would have on London. We must build elevated highways on viaducts. We must drive tunnels under obstacles like the River Thames or sanctuaries like Kensington Gardens. Well, now, my time's up. In a London replanned like that, I might be home in 15 minutes. Tonight, it'll be an hour. These futuristic road schemes were never built. The introduction of automatic traffic lights and of new kinds of traffic management did help to ease the problem. But for London Transport, the switch to private motoring was a threat. It not only slowed bus traffic, it was taking away passengers. By 1939, there were nearly half a million private cars registered in London and the home counties. Though the outbreak of war brought a temporary halt to the growth in car ownership, the writing was on the wall for London Transport. The number of passengers carried by London Transport reached its historic peak just after the war, but by 1939, its heyday was nearly over.